Magandang araw sa inyong lahat. Good day to all. I am Dr. Carmencita Padilla, one of the proponents of the newborn screening program in the Philippines. Join me in uncovering the wonderful story of newborn screening in our country. Together, let's zoom in on what makes newborn screening a comprehensive program for every Filipino here at Newborn Screening in Focus. To ensure that newborns are truly healthy, they must undergo newborn screening, a public health program that helps determine if a baby is born with one of the more than 20 congenital disorders. Its importance cannot be overemphasized. If any of the congenital disorders is left undetected and not managed immediately, it can lead to mental retardation and death. It was integrated into the public health delivery system with the enactment of Republic Act 9288 or Newborn Screening Act of 2004. Now part of uh, the PhilHealth's newborn care package, newborn screening is being offered in more than 7,000 hospitals and birthing centers nationwide. It has also saved thousands of children. This educational series is intended for health professionals who deliver services of the newborn screening program. Whether you are online or offline, this program aims to further enrich your knowledge in newborn screening and be able to apply the highest quality service to Filipinos, especially during challenging times. We will discuss the very process of newborn screening from the moment the baby is born and, and into the continuing care available for newborns found positive. We will also zero in on the features and management of each of the conditions included in the newborn screening panel. We will also interview patients as well as their parents. And in keeping up to the challenges, talk over how facilities and centers manage to give quality service despite the limits brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. This program is the newest educational platform for our newborn screening coordinators, one in every 7,200 health facilities throughout the country. We hope that this program will also benefit the health professionals, physicians, nurses, midwives, med techs, as well as students in the health professions. So take a seat, get comfortable as you're in for quite an adventure here at Newborn Screening in Focus. Nung panahon namin kasi wala yung mga ganyan. Unang-una hindi namin alam kung may mga ganyan palang ano ang gobyerno. Hindi mo na, lalo na pag sa bahay lang nanganganak. Kasi siyempre sa edad kong ito, masanay na rin ako na ang pagkapanganak niya, hindi siya kaagad kinaano ng mga doktor. Bale, pagka mga, eh, mga haliwa, after one month, pupunta lang sa health center, doon sila magpapabakuna ng mga polio, ng ano pa ba yun? Mga tik sa tikdas. Yun lang, magpapabakuna yung mga bagong panganak. Um, Una-una po nung nag-training po kami nung 2011 po ata yun, siyempre una yung experience namin doon ay medyo may kaba na pag umano mag-extract ng blood sa baby. Tapos minsan ay hindi madami, nagtutusok po kami ng mga dalawang bisi sa paa ng baby. Hanggang nung bandang huli ay na talagang okay na rin po. Kasi ang technique po doon ay Ang nanay palaging pinapainom ng mga gatas, may mga ano po para tuloy-tuloy ang pagsak ng baby po at doon pala ay ma makakakuha kami ng maraming blood po sa baby. Isang drop po ay puno na kaagad yung circle. Ito sa amin, hindi, hindi po nagkakaroon ng problema kasi sa 12 barangays po ay halos kilala naman po namin lahat ang mga uh, from the prenatal din from hanggang mga anak hanggang sa pag ano pag new, newborn screening minsan lang po ay nauubusan kami ng filter card ay 
hindi po maka-avail ang mga nanay dahil po ay uh, mahirap din ang buhay ng ibang mga nanay. Pero yung meron naman po, talagang bumibili na rin sila sa ano, minsan po pinipinans ng midwife na iba, doon po kami nagpapabili. Uh, mabilis lang silang makuhaan ng mga informasyon. Tapos pag sinabi namin na babalik ng ganitong araw o minsan, bago kami mag-discharge, at least after 24 hours po ay makaka-newborn makaka screening po kami sa kanila. Um, sa mga kananayan na mayroong mga uh, bagong panganak na baby, kailangan po ay uh, maka-expanded expanded newborn screening po talaga kasi doon natin malalaman na Uh, kung ano ang mga sakit ng baby, at least po ay mas maagang maagapan. Last week, we discussed about dry blood spot sample collection, an integral step in the newborn screening process. For this episode, we will talk about factors that might affect the newborn screening results and what should be done about it. All the data collected are important in the interpretation of newborn screening results and are critical for the immediate recall of patients who have positive results in screening. Today, we will discuss the different reasons a baby may need a repeat newborn screen. We have Dr. Ana Lea Elizaga, Unit Head of the Newborn Screening Center, National Institutes of Health. It serves the hospital and birthing centers of the National Capital Region, Region 4B or Mimaropa, and Region 5 or Bicol Region. We also have Dr. Edgar Winston Posicion, Unit Head of the Newborn Screening Visayas. And it serves all the hospitals, and birthing centers in Region 6 and 8. Dr. Yeye, Dr. Ed, welcome to Newborn Screening in Focus. So let's start the conversation. Dr. Yeye, why is it so important to fill up all the information in the filter card? Well, the information written on the filter card are all essential in the proper interpretation of results and therefore are critical for the recall of our positive screen cases. So, so let's focus on feeding. Why is it important that we tick the box on feeding? If feeding information is not stated, we can run the test, but then the laboratory would not be able to properly interpret results for galactosemia, for MSUD, as well as for other metabolic disorders because feeding has to be initiated first before we know if a baby has a metabolic disorder. So there has to be a protein intake in order to trigger metabolism. So these disorders would be released then as unsatisfactory results, specifically as missing information. So all the other disorders not affected by feeding can however be released. So, so what you're saying, Dr. Ye, is that of the 29 conditions that are being uh, screened, that are included in the panel, there are certain disorders that will need at least one feeding uh, for the proper interpretation of the results, right, Dr. Yes, yes. Yes. yes, that is correct. That is so, correct. What, so what happens, you know, you, you get a sample uh, where in the information is not uh, complete. What does the laboratory do uh, uh, with regards to these cases? Well, for these instances, our follow-up nurses at the newborn screening center would call the facility and request to send us a written certification that is duly signed by the NBS coordinator or the attending physician stating on the type of feeding the baby had during the time of collection. So by providing us with this information, the laboratory would be able to update and give accurate uh, results and release the appropriate instructions and recommendations. Okay, so just for our viewers, every hospital or birthing facility has a newborn screening coordinator that actually arranges the collection of the samples and also the transport of the samples to, lab, to the laboratory, which we call a newborn screening center. Um, so Dr. Yeye now is saying that 
if the information is incomplete, then we have to go back to the hospital or birthing center for the completion of the information. So she mentioned um, the follow-up nurses. Each of our newborn screening center actually has a follow-up nurse and all they do is to call up actually the doctor or the coordinator or the nurse or the midwife uh, for, you know, for assistance in completion of the information. So you mentioned feeding. So I'd like to ask just how much feeding are we talking about, uh, Dr. Yeye? Well, as long as the baby has lactose feeding for at least 24 hours from birth, that should already be adequate to proceed with the screening. So there should never be a delay uh, in doing the newborn screening at the ideal age of collection because other disorders can be released ahead, which are not affected by the feeding. Okay, so in other words, if you don't like the result, if you want the results to be complete, then uh, let, you know, we should fill up that form properly. Now, let's go to the other issues. Let's, um, let's still go into the issue of feeding. Let me ask Dr. Ed, what about uh, newborns were in, in the box, they, they actually take partial or total parenteral nutrition? Dr. Ed. Partial or total partial nutrition will have an effect on uh, expanded newborn screening. As you know, uh, most of the component of, of, of partial parental nutrition are protein. So we give them amino acids, and that will affect the, the test. So we need to know, you know this is a critical decision uh, in, on the part of the newborn screener. Uh, whether to tick that box or not, because this has a significant effect on the result of the test. So how will the TPN affect the results, Dr. Ed? The maybe, amino acid profile. Yeah. Maybe you can also give us an example for our viewers. Uh, yes, ma'am. The amino acid profile changes with uh, TPN. As I said, because TPN is uh, mostly protein. If you put in lipid, which is part of and that will also affect the lipid profile of the, of the baby. Um, and so when we do the newborn seeding test, we, we have to be aware that the patient is receiving exogenous protein and exogenous lipid. And that will, because that will definitely affect the result of the test. So, so what Dr. Ed is saying is that when we really do newborn screening for the newborns, we're, we're, we're expecting that the baby is really normal and not receiving any other form outside mm -hmm. of the regular feeding. And I think it's very important now to remember that that box on feeding is going to be important for the interpretation of the results. So if you want to avoid a possible repeat or a false interpretation, do fill up that box on feeding. Let, let's go to another issue on, um, on uh, the form. Um, what, what are... The other, what are the other things that we must inform the lab uh, when sending a sample? Uh, Dr. Yeye, what are the other information that we must inform our newborn screening center about the baby? We also need information if uh, the baby had blood transfusion. So, so if a uh, newborn screening was done after a blood transfusion, it's important to know first what type of blood component was transfused, as well as the date and the time of the transfusion, because this will help us determine on what instructions to give our facilities. So this information should be clearly stated in the filter card. So, so can you give us some specific examples on the, the, the issue of timing of blood transfusion and uh, the possible result? Yes. If if, for example, the expanded newborn screening was collected less than 48 hours after a PAC RBC or a fresh whole blood transfusion, then we have to repeat the test after 48 hours to test for all disorders. So this is to ensure that we are testing the baby's blood and not the donor's blood. So there is also a need to test, uh, to repeat the test after two weeks because specifically we need to repeat the CH because blood transfusion can mask hypothyroidism, giving us a false negative test for CH. And this is also true for G6PD, for galactosemia enzyme, for biotinidase, as well as for hemoglobinopathies, because uh, blood transfusion can also mask the absence of enzymes and the protein intrinsic to the red blood cells. So another test has to be 
repeated after 120 days following the lifespan of red blood cells. These are for G6PD, for, for galactosemia enzyme, for biotinidase, and for homeoglobinopathy. So by then, we are sure that what we are testing is already the baby's blood. So, so the, the, the message I'm getting from you, Dr. Ye, is that um, if you can do the test before a, a blood transfusion, that will be the best time. Because once uh, the blood transfusion is actually, uh, the, the blood is given to the baby, then there are so many other factors that have to be considered. Yes. That's yes. the recommendation. Okay, so remember that if, um, if, um, if, you're going, if you're considering a blood transfusion, as much as possible, do your newborn screening before the blood transfusion. Okay, so and um, how will the how will the attending physician or the nurse or the midwife know that the test will have to be repeated? Where will they where will they see this uh, advice? Well, uh, we are releasing uh, results for this uh, with specific instructions, so they would know. Uh, after how many days or after two weeks or after 120 days. They are all indicated in the uh, results that will be sent to the facility through courier and uh, through calls also. Okay, so, so our advice is that uh, uh, we should do a newborn screening before any blood transfusion so that we don't have to repeat the test. Okay, but you're saying that if I have a baby and uh, definitely had a blood transfusion, the results of uh, that baby will have that guidance in the result that you will release. Am I correct, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, they will be called, the facility will be informed, and then they will also be instructed um, in a hard copy, through a hard copy that will be sent to the facilities. And I would also like to mention that these uh, tests are all free of charge. So the newborn screening center is replacing the filter cards used by the facilities for these patients. Okay, so what the Dr. Ye is saying is that do not hesitate repeating the, the, the test because there is no added cost to the program. So um, if ever the test will have to re be repeated, then by all means, just submit the sample. Um, I think, you know, this is also the, I'd like to highlight the issue of making sure that the, the parents have a copy of the result, because if the test will have to be done after 120 days, you know, somebody has to remind them and having a hard copy of that result will make a lot of difference. So thank you, Dr. Yeye. Let, let's go to another issue, because I know that there are certain maternal factors that may also affect the, uh, uh, the result. So uh, Dr. Ed, can, can you discuss, you know, maybe uh, share with our viewers certain maternal factors that may affect the uh, NBS results. Sure, ma'am. Um, there are actually a lot of, of maternal influences into the, into the eventual result of the ENBS test, basically because uh, the fetus derives uh, most of his nutrients from the mother. So the, the basic thing is that whatever the mother's condition is while pregnant will eventually affect uh, the fetus. And if, for example, the mother has a maternal condition, for example, the mother is hypothyroid and she's receiving exogenous thyroid hormone, uh, this uh, will affect, affect also the baby's newborn screening test for obvious reasons. So even if the baby does not have congenital hypothyroidism, but the point is that the mother was taking exogenous uh, thyroid hormones, this will definitely affect the test. So you have to allow, uh, number one, we, the, the screeners, the laboratory needs to be informed that the mother is on certain types of medication, which may affect the test. And then uh, the laboratory must be aware also that uh, uh, the test may be affected by the maternal condition. That's just one example for, for medication. Second, if the mother, for example, is taking steroids, you know, and the baby somehow has congenital hypothyroidism, but because the mother was taking exogenous steroids, this again affects the 17 OHP levels of the baby, which renders the test uh, unreliable at that point in time. So what the laboratory just needs to know, what the, labor what the center just needs to know is that uh, what maternal condition uh, did the mother have at the time of birth? And what, if any, medications were or was she taking uh, at the time that she was uh, having the baby? 
this will help us a great deal in interpreting the results um, and therefore reduce uh, follow-up time or uh, reduce uh, repeat time. And this will also uh, put, put a heads up or warn our follow-up people to follow up these cases uh, or these patients, those particular patients closely because the, that test was affected by either maternal uh, medical condition or affected by med certain medications that the mother was taking at the time that she was pregnant. So, so thank you, Dr. Ed. I think, you know, that's very important information for our, for our audience that any information about the mother, any condition must be declared uh, uh, at the time of uh, the sample is done so that you can uh, better you know, evaluate you know, the interpretation of the results. And, um, and uh, in, your, in your experience, Dr. Ed, what are the very common cases that have been listed in the maternal factors in your more than a decade of experience with the program? I'll ask the same question from Dr. Yale. Um, to us, um, uh, congenital hypothyroidism has been uh, most affected because uh, the, you know the incidence of thyroid disease in pregnant mothers is rather high. No, so it's crucial that we know uh, what medications was she taking. Was she taking uh, propylthiouracil, for example, which suppresses thyroid hormone production? If she was hypothyroid, that has an effect on the test also. Or the reverse may be true. Uh, she has become so hypothyroid that she's now taking exogenous uh, thyroid hormone. That also will affect the test. So in, in our experience in the desires, uh, uh, the diagnosis of congenital hypothyroidism has been affected by the relatively high incidence of either hyperthyroidism in mothers or hypothyroidism in mothers. Uh, we rarely see mothers on high dose steroids, although be careful because some mothers who are asthmatic uh, may be taking uh, exogenous steroids as well during the times that they were on asthma medication. As you know, steroids are a common medications given to uh, anybody who has asthma. Uh, and if she's on, on it for a long time, that may also affect the test. Certain kidney disorders, uh, certain immunologic disorders, for example, uh, lupus system, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus who are on, whose mothers are on chronic steroids, that may also affect the test part. But that's rather rare. Uh, to us, CH really is the one that is most affected because of the relatively high incidence uh, of that among pregnant mothers. Uh, insulin may not necessarily affect uh, metabolic profiles uh, if the mother is on exogenous insulin, although insulin passes through the placenta as well and makes its way to the baby. It mostly affects the glucose profile, but in our experience, um, it does not affect significantly, or it does not affect significantly uh, metabolic profiling for this kid. Uh, it's more on the, in the, on, in the endocrinology part uh, that has really made a significant effect on our results. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ed. What about in Manila at NIH, Dr. Yeye? What are the frequent um, conditions that you've picked up uh, that you, you, know, you think have affected the results of our uh, results, uh, effect of results of our uh, babies? So for the maternal conditions, if the mother has, uh, for example, like what Doc had mentioned earlier, uh, is taking antithyroid drugs that can also have an effect on the results of the newborn baby, we can have a false negative result for CH. So if we um, receive samples and then uh, it is indicated in the card, even if the results are normal, we release them as normal, but uh, needing uh, consultation with a pediatric endocrinologist for proper assessment. I think that's, you know, that's a good point to, to maybe to share with the viewer is that um, the information is important on how the result is going to be released. Uh, in this particular case, because of the additional maternal inf information on the mother, there is an added clause that, you know, maybe consultation may be needed. So Dr. Yeye, yeah, yeah, let's just this time let's talk about antibiotics because we have a lot of patients who actually probably on uh, treatment for sepsis. How do antibiotics affect the results of our screen? Well, antibiotics is not really a contraindication in performing the expanded newborn screening. However, it should be stated in the filter card for our reference. So there are, however, other medications that can affect results. 
And uh, one is the administration of steroids. And this can give false negative result for CH and CAH because of the suppression of the thyroid stimulating hormone and the 17 hydroxyprogesterone. So dopamine can also uh, give us a false negative result for CH for the same reason. So, so what I'm hearing from Dr. Yen, Dr. Ed, is um, if you are a screener watching us right now, any information about the mother and the baby are both important because it may actually affect the, uh, the, the way the results will be interpreted. Now, we did not go into the details of each of these conditions. If you are wondering why we're not going to get to, to more detail, because in another episode, we're going to talk about just about congenital about congenital adrenal hyperplasia. In another episode, we will have, we'll be talking about uh, congenital hypothyroidism. So uh, overall, I think what is important for the viewers to remember is that fill up that form, that card, because all the information that you actually include in that card will be important for the eventual interpretation of the results. Um, let, let, um, let me just discuss now uh, in terms of uh, timing, because I know that, you know, especially now during COVID, there have been problems about uh, the transit time. Maybe I can ask Dr. Ed, you know, how has this affected the results of our screens? It's just all bad news if you talk about screening times in the time of pandemic. Um, we've had significant delays in the initial screen. We've had significant delays in repeat screening as well as in on follow up uh, for various reasons. It may be career, it may be lockdowns, it may be uh, you know the hospital itself. Uh, logistics may also play a very important role. Uh, but what we're trying to emphasize here is that um, uh, we should really do the test on schedule, no? do it at, at 24 hours and one minute after uh, the baby is born uh, and then uh, process it properly and then just, just call your local courier uh, to pick it up uh, when, whenever that may possibly happen. Uh, and then we will just make adjustments. As you know, the longer the time between extraction and the time of testing is done, the more difficult it is to interpret the result. Uh, and so the possibility of having a repeat test done uh, increases as the delays in whatever, for whatever reason, uh, happen. You know? so, but what, what we usually just advise the new, our newborn screeners is just do the test at the right time, process it, call your courier company, uh, or uh, have the, uh, the filter cards brought to your uh, to the nearest courier company or arrange some kind of pickup. Uh, and then eventually it will make its way to our laboratory. When we see the results and when we see the test, then we will have to uh, act on it appropriately. If it's been more than 14 days, then it needs a repeat test. But usually the, uh, the good news is, is that when there's a delay in the testing or delay in the processing, these kids are already, meaning they go straight to the follow-up people and uh, the follow-up people will give the adv appropriate advice to the center or to the parents on how to go about uh, repeating the test. So, so Dr. Ed, I think, you know, that's, uh, you know, excellent advice. We're telling our screeners in the audience that um, you really must do the test, you know, after 24 hours and then the next uh, responsibility is finding a way that it gets to the lab. And I just want to um, relate to the group that if you're having difficulty, you have to contact the Department of Health because the Department of Health is our partner. And if there's difficulty in bringing the sample to the, to the laboratory, then they actually will be a big resource in making it happen. We actually have another episode just talking about, you know, how being able to manage uh, these cases of uh, uh, delays in transit because of the pandemic. Now, I'd like to address another question that I have here uh, for Dr. Ed and Dr. Ye. Have you encountered occasions wherein you've got the wrong information in the card? I'll start with Dr. Ye. Yes, um, there are cases when we receive wrong information of the card, like for example, for the dates of birth and the dates of collection. So 
uh, we'd like to inform the facilities and, the, and our healthcare professionals and our partners that some of the ENVS disorders being tested have age-related reference values. So for example, for MSMS, we have a less than seven days and more than seven days cutoffs. So if there is an error in the date of birth and the date of collection, that can definitely affect our interpretation of results. So results can be elevated for less than seven days, but can be normal if a baby is really more than seven days old already. So uh, please also take note uh, of the order of the dates in the filter card. It should be day, month, and year. So error in filling this up would provide us an incorrect age of the baby. Oh, that's that's interesting. You know, just the date of the the the, the birthday and the collection will make a lot of difference in the interpretation. What about in the Visayas, uh, Doctor Ed? Do you have to encounter the uh, uh, cases wherein you've got the wrong result in the uh, uh, in the cards? In the last fifteen years, uh, one of the things that are so difficult to control uh, is the proper data encoding into the filter card. Uh, it, it's really funny how uh, the technology has advanced, but the way people write has not changed. Uh, so it's a recurring theme in our meeting. Uh, either the data is not there, the data is uh, difficult to decipher because the handwriting is terrible, or the data is wrong. And um, over the years, we have made so many creative moves to try to correct that. And the only thing we have done really is to uh, uh, try to teach our newborn screeners how to write properly, how to write legibly. Um, so I, I think the, the, the basic thing here is that for newborn screeners to understand that what they put in the filter card is crucial. And the way they put it in the, in the filter card is crucial as well. Um, memos after memos have been sent out to please try to write the, uh, the items legibly. Do not be in a hurry. We, we would put a top 10 or sometimes, you know, when we go to the field, when we used to go to the field, we would flash out uh, a, a, a slide about, we would have a contest. What, and what do you think this reads? Because they're so difficult to read. But in fact, our encoders have been so good with uh, decoding difficult to read handwriting that they're actually professionals at it. So I think what's very important is for, are the basic things for, for newborn students to understand, right? Legibly uh, input as much correct information as you can. If you do not know what the information is asked, or rather than put in something there, that will go back to you anyway, because if the information is wrong, we will call you anyway, and we will investigate it anyway. So it, you know you're, you're going to end up uh, you're going to end up spending more time uh, with this particular case. So, but if you get it right the first time, you write it down properly. It is something everybody can read. Then the process just runs through uh, uh, smoothly. Smoothly. Um, so these basic things we've been really trying to. Uh, 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 correct, but you know, people's handwritings are all different, especially if it's a doctor, it's a little difficult to decipher. Uh, people write letters differently as well. Uh, and, and sometimes when, when there's too many, they also get confused. So there have been instances where uh, um, the wrong filter card was filled out for the wrong baby. And that's really difficult to, to manage. But, uh, and, and you know what happens is that we send a team to the facility to actually investigate it. You know? So uh, perhaps one of the important things I would like to emphasize is that uh, if you get it right the first time, there is less hassle. But if it's wrong to start with, it's a wrong information, difficult to read, difficult to interpret, then it sort of comes back to you and there'll be more time you're going to spend because people from your work senior will be coming in, talk to the supervisor, People from newborn cleaning will be coming in to visit because what's wrong? Why is this? Why are these cards wrong? So you end up spending or wasting more time on something that could have been done easier and something that could have taken less time. Uh, and so that's one of the struggles, I guess, of, of newborn screening, trying to uh, uh, you know smoothen out everything and try to make it more efficient. Wow, that's that's interesting. You know, just 
writing legibly is very important, but you're talking to, to the right audience now, uh, Dr. Ed, because uh, we're expecting our uh, facilities and uh, university coordinates to be listening to us. Now, there are, I, there's so much we have learned actually from both of you. So, uh, and we're actually devoting another episode just on uh, issues that affect actually the results. But for, for today, uh, the, can I have some final words from both of you? I'll start with uh, Dr. Ed. Dr. Ed, any final words? Uh, Bon, thank you for this opportunity to uh, uh, to talk to our newborn screeners and to discuss some very important issues with regards to at this episode anyway, processing and uh, uh, getting things right. Um, I think I think the the the, uh, the the final word here is rather simple: get it right the first time. If you get it right the first time, you'll work less. You know, you, you, there'll be less trouble in the end. You know? uh, there'll be less trouble for everybody, including you and the laboratory. So getting it right the first time is crucial uh, as the first initial good step towards good newborn screening. And also to get the job done right uh, means you'll be spending less time. Uh, efficiency uh, increases when, when we get data correct and we get everything correct the first time. And we are trying, we are training. Uh, we know that there's a, uh, there's a lot of changes in the system. Uh, people are being reassigned to a lot of other places, especially with COVID. Uh, but we are building and we are increasing our online courses to teach uh, our newborn students how to get things right. Thank you, Dr. Ed. What about Dr. Yaya? Any final words? Well, first, ma'am, thank you for this opportunity and for being uh, invited in this uh, episode. Well, as part of the NBS program, we should all be aware of the different factors affecting newborn screening results. So the newborn screening center and the laboratory are relying only on the information that you give us uh, that you wrote on the filter card. And so we we must ensure that all fields are completely filled up with the correct information because this will be the basis of the laboratory for releasing results and giving correct instructions and recommendations. Thank you, Dr. Yeye. Remember that in collecting this sample, it is important to completely provide all information asked on the filter card. Do not miss a single bit of information. These data are all important in the interpretation of results and are critical for the immediate recall of patients who have positive results in screening. Again, as mentioned in this episode, write legibly, completely, and adequately. Thank you very much to our guests today, Dr. Yeye Elizaga and Dr. Ed Posichon. In this episode, we have learned that certain scenarios and factors do affect the results of the newborn screening. False positivity and false negativity may happen depending on the situation. Data collected are important in the interpretation of the results and are critical for the immediate recall of patients who have positive results in the screening. There are different factors that can occur that may require repeat sample collection for newborn screening to have accurate results. To our virtual audience, please send us your comments, questions, or list of topics that you want us to cover in our succeeding episodes. Email us at info at newbornscreening.ph or, or you may tweet us at newbornscreeningph and also include the hashtag, hashtag EMBSPH. Before we end, I want to take this opportunity to present to you the new addition to our tools and learning, our EMBS mobile app. The EMBS mobile app is a one-stop hub for all MBS health workers on everything they need to know about newborn screening. It also features a rewards program that our health workers can use to earn points and you should use it to claim shop vouchers with our partners. If you have already downloaded the app, answer the quiz and we will send to your inbox to earn those points. 
we continue to improve our services as deemed necessary by the emerging challenges to an open dialogue about our experiences in newborn screening. It is our hope that through this program, we extend the sharing of knowledge with greater reach, empower the frontliners, improve connectivity with newborn screening coordinators, and most importantly, provide unparalleled service to every family. For our next episode, we will continue to discuss other factors affecting NBS, this time focusing on prematurity, low birth weight, and other neonatal factors. This and more here in Newborn Screening in Focus. Nothing is more precious than seeing a child grow healthy and normal. Let's realize this through newborn screening. Newborn screening is a gift of life. Sa iyo rin to, sa kalusukan mo.